Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us on another edition of DevOps Unbound. We have a really great uh, DevOps Unbound topic to explore today, and that is, you know, that testing is not a monolith. We, we, a lot of people, especially people who aren't familiar with testing, just say testing, QA, testing, and, and we think of, oh, it's a test. And, you know, and we, we know there's different kinds of tests, but do we really know all the different kinds of tests that need to be done? You know, when we, as we're developing and deploying and managing and monitoring software and applications and, and so forth, I don't think so. I think really, you know, we, we, we could cater this show to those of you out there who do know, but I think today we want to talk a little bit to those who don't know as well, and let's try to get you educated on what some of the various aspects of testing are that you may not be familiar with. They're important, nevertheless, and, and how they influence what you see in the apps you use and, and what we may see going forward. We've got a great panel to introduce you to today. I'm going to start, I'm going to allow them each to introduce themselves. Let me first start off with Leandro Melendez. I, I can't say it with that Spanish roll of the tongue that, that you can, Leandro, I apologize. And, and Leandro's known in the industry as well as a name, but I'm going to let, I don't want to steal the thunder. Leandro, introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, don't worry, you made a great pronunciation of my name, way better than what I'm used to. So that was pretty good. Uh, okay. Yeah. Repeating, I'm Leandro Melendez, um, a performance test manager from Qualitas Group. And as well, uh, known in the internet as Señor Performo, as uh, you will said, Performo, a strong R's. And um, well, uh, we provide several services to my specialty is performance testing, integrating it right now with um, all continuous integration, DevOps and agile methodologies. But uh, as well, and, uh, and you mentioned it um, very well earlier, it starts to permeate in other areas of testing when you start to do it holistically and uh, at a large scale and thinking on all of the steps uh, on the SDLC. Uh, so we will talk a little bit more about it. Uh, last thing about me, as I said, Señor Performo, um, in the internet, I have a YouTube channel. I try to... Uh, help educate people on especially performance testing, but anything that comes testing and methodologies, agile, DevOps, and all that. I'm very happy to help uh, provide information. And uh, as well as here, whoever gives me a chance to speak and share the knowledge, I'm very happy to. We're, we're honored to have you here, like Leandro. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to introduce Ken Pugh. Ken, is, uh, well, can you introduce yourself? Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. Hi, I'm Ken Pugh. I've been a uh, in the programming software development field for about uh, uh, two fifths of a century, and in agile for about a fifth of a century, and doing everything from gathering requirements to final testing. I've got a book out called Lean Agile Acceptance Test Driven Development: Better Software Through Collaboration. And I've been teaching, training, and emphasizing acceptance test-driven development slash behavior-driven development for the past 15 years. Fantastic. And for our Fraction Challenge friends in the audience, a fifth of a century is about 20 years. So we <laughs> give you a little idea. Next up, we have Christine Fisher. Christine, welcome. Introduce yourself, please. Thank you. My name is Christine Fisher. I manage a team of BAs, QAs, and UX at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Uh, my team and I have been on a journey with behavior-driven development over the last two and a half years. And as we get ready to talk about testing here, my big secret is I've actually never been a tester. I just have managed some. But with our um, jump into DevOps, I felt very strongly about advocating for what our role should be and how the work should change to keep up with the, the other changes that were happening with DevOps, which helped lead us to BDD. Fantastic. Pre-COVID times, we'd say, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Um, but we can't even say that anymore. Um, last but not least is my co-host and anchor on our show, Mitchell Ashley. Mitchell, why don't you quick introduction? 
I don't know what fractions I've worked, but I, I do know that I used that joke last night and my family had never heard it. So, <laughs> so much for the holiday and express joke, but, uh, yeah. no, I, I'm a, I'm an old software person started in software, um, and, uh, have, have done lots of things around, uh, cl both cloud as well as, uh, I've also been on the vendor side. So in network security, uh, and SaaS services. So, um, Testing people are some of the most unique and, in my world, beloved people because those are the folks I really look to to say, how are we doing? How, where are we? And I think even more so in the DevOps time. So I'm excited to, uh, to explore this with you all. So thanks for joining us. Fantastic. So first of all, let's assume that our whole audience aren't test experts. They're more DevOps generalists. There's a good spattering of cybersecurity folks, cloud native infrastructure ops, and and we're we're throwing out some tome, some uh, you know, uh, ADD B behavior driven BDD, you know that they may not be familiar with. So why don't we? do a quick, you know, kind of def definition. And we're going to ask the non-tester, if you will, Christine, if you wouldn't mind leading off uh, with, you know, what, what are these references we've made to, to these types of testing? Sure. So when we're talking about behavior-driven development, we're talking about understanding the behavior of the end user and understanding what the workflows are, why they are trying to accomplish that task, and working on testing, understanding the requirements, testing those requirements in that way, not just writing a requirement, developing a requirement, testing a requirement without any true understanding of what the person who's going to use the software on the end does. Um, and when I talk about not being a tester, more on the functional side with requirements as a BA, things like that, um, that was always the interesting part to me. And then sometimes we would test something and it would be tested correctly, but we still miss the mark. And so having the whole team understand what the end user wants to do, putting it into common language, that's really important for behavior-driven development. Agreed. Agreed. Ken, do you want to add anything? Yeah. So, so one of the big things in, in behavior-driven development or acceptance test-driven development is having the triad and Christine sort of made a, a reference to it, the customer, developer, and tester get together prior to implementation, create the scenarios, the scenarios become the tests, and the developers are given those tests to run against their code. And those tests are the agreed upon shared understanding of how the system should work. Got it. Senor Performo, is that correct? Yeah? See? Very well said. Yeah. <laughs> Senor Performo, how does, you know, acceptance driven, behavior driven development figure into your performance testing uh, kind of regimen, if you will? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this type of uh, concepts permeate in all the testing um, practices, uh, if I could say. And uh, very well, as it was said uh, here, I like to call it uh, the three amigos that uh, you put them together. And even before you start rolling anything, drafting anything, you get the requirements well together with uh, what you are going to be testing and what has to be marked as passed before you even uh, or a developer can mark a task as completed. And uh, I might have said it wrong, a developer, because... In general, you're supposed to be a team and everyone is rep responsible for each element. And this comes together with uh, performance metrics where in general, most of the people, when they think about performance, uh, they go, their mind go right away to low tests when I have to put hundreds of users to slam a uh, system where uh, if you see it from the beginning, as well as uh, some of these uh, requirements, when you generate them, that, I don't know, give an example that the text field has to just allow a uh, certain given of characters or uh, be this color rounded, uh, little definitions like that. It should have included uh, performance metrics as well inside of it so that when you are generating uh, any piece of software or functionality, it's measured there and then 
I have to say it's an issue that I found often in the old waterfall days. I would arrive to do a low test um, after six months of development and start to automate some things that I'm like, this, hey, everybody, this is visibly slow. Just I'm the single guy. I don't need to low test it. Why no one caught this before? And those are the most general problems in terms, I, I think as well in functionality, some things that come from even unit tests, uh, low level tiers where you could catch many of those uh, bugs and performance um, SLIs that are not met. And that's how it integrates uh, a lot with performance. I always preach that you need to start to think about it as early as possible. And as Christine mentioned, getting the people together, though, what are the goals? What is the user, user going to require? And what are the tasks? Because uh, not everything should respond super fast. Not everything should uh, or can have a good response. I mean, we all wish that a, I don't know, monthly uh, billing period can be closed in three seconds, but that's just for a response time from a click. So we need to filter that out depending on what is the user needing, willing to um, endure, to call it in a way, and put it together. Uh, and this permeates as well. It's some sort of functionality like, yeah, I need this to respond in this period of time for me to be comfortable using it, for it to be useful, functional. Comments, thoughts from the team? So as, as you were mentioning that, uh, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with healthcare.gov. Um, <laughs> I think, oh, uh, yeah. I think, I think they should have had a, a few performance tests done well before they released it. Um, it, it seems like, um, I don't know, that, that it was like uh, maybe the day before they went, I guess we're going to have a lot of people on this. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think uh, and to paint and explain what I was saying, with the single element that doesn't perform well, that doesn't work well, even from the initial tier, uh, they should have created these requirements saying, like, I don't know, um, when, I'm, when I log in and enroll healthcare, start the process, when I click this, it should respond this fast, it should not do, I don't know, these many uh, full table scans, connections to the database, go, things that you can go way, way low level in the IT tier. And others, and it's just like, yeah, I'm, the user should not wait more than five seconds on that click. Single user, one person. I am almost sure that most of the problems that they had was that they, not, they didn't start to tune that and they allowed the developers to check in all that um, awesome code to call it uh, euphemistically. And that's uh, when you start to scale up problematic things is when everything derails. And yeah, healthcare.gov. Aside of not doing uh, good load testing, they had multiple issues at the single piece level. And that's where it is, push it left. Start to think at a unit level, single item, requirements, uh, when you have the three amigos together uh, talking about these things, take everything into account and don't let uh, your little post-its to be marked as done and move to the uh, next area of your board without covering some of those basic requirements, who, which most of people doesn't think about or include them or whenever, and, and this is uh, a little um, BDD or TDD, uh, when the developer is working on it, should have in mind all those requirements, functional, performance, security. And that's where I say all this permeates to all the testing areas and other metrics when um, other areas of testing are doing their tests, manual, uh, functional, automated, even security. My goal is to start to gather performance metrics so that everything happens together and we don't have to wait uh, until the end for big low tests to figure out that uh, healthcare.gov will have what happens, <laughs> sadly. So, so hey, actually, you, no, so um, you were talking about something that I've, in fact, I've, I've done a few blogs on this, but it's been around for a while, is the testing matrix i.e. that shows, since we're talking about testing is not just about functionality, it describes all the different sorts of tests from the functionality tests, which are on one side of the matrix, 
to the quality tests, which are on the other side, including performance, security, usability, and so forth. And that your testing, I mean, ATDD and BDD tend to concentrate on the functionality because we're gonna be talking with the customers, that's what you want. But you ought to have all those other tests, the performance tests, as you're mentioning, already established ahead of time, 100,000 users, how fast should it be and so forth. Oh, and the, in fact, just the usability you were talking about, how long should it be after I click that I get to the next page? And those things can be established ahead of time. And if a developer runs up and it's not meeting it, he knows to fix it. That's, we don't and, have and to- And I would say it. here, not only established, but worked on from day one, because as you mentioned, even some uh, usability, security, those start to be checked when everything is assembled. And uh, there are many techniques that uh, we can start to embrace uh, starting our automations at different tiers. As I said, I am a big uh, proposal or, or supporter of, yes, have unit testing automated everywhere, have the, co uh, the coverage uh, according to the pyramid. Don't focus so much on manual, front end, or after the fact, leaving everything for uh, the second Friday of the sprint when everyone wants to leave and here, tester, there you go, start automating. Yeah, that's where everyone has to start to work together um, and pushing it left. Since day one, start thinking about uh, performance, security, functionals. And even uh, some ma ma have told me like, yeah, but there are things that, like, as you said, usability, uh, that cannot be done until the end. Well, you can start creating mocks. You can start uh, figuring how things should work and start to work them. And uh, again, I think the mindset uh, of keeping testing faced uh, waterfall ways, we need to start to work everything our power and uh, get it rolling. Yeah, I totally agree. I'd like to speak to that point a little bit with um, DevOps and with the right. testing. And we've been talking about a team and we've been talking about getting people involved. And what I was seeing when we, in my organization, when we first started talking about DevOps is everybody is an engineer. We can all do these jobs, things like that, right? And that jobs might change. There's room for everybody, but what you're doing might change a little bit. But that can be really scary to hear. And especially if you are a manual tester, who really doesn't have an inclination or desire to learn automation. And that's okay, like that's a different conversation, but I am always a proponent of manual testers. So I, one of the reasons that really pushed me toward that is hearing that conversation, seeing people on my team, you know, being told that their job might change, but we don't know how, you're an engineer, you can do what everybody else on this team does, but that's not true. Not everybody has those skills. And so making sure that the team is involved and when you can have these conversations, BDD, all, all of these things that we're talking about now, right, in, are getting the testers involved in the conversation earlier. And that makes them part of the team. And we have taken our BAs, we've taken manual QA, we've taken um, our automation QA, we get them all involved in that conversation. We make sure the developers know where they are in the process. We make sure the developers are adding to the conversation and part of that process and it was really important to me in that DevOps environment to get out in front of that and help define that role. When somebody is saying, we don't, you know, again, your role might change, but we're not quite sure how. I wanted to help my team define that and put us in a good position. So we weren't just sitting there um, to have, you know, God forbid a developer come down a few years later and tell us, now you do it like this. We wanted to put ourselves into that position and having those conversations. Um, I think is such an important part of that um, and changes some of that, that dialogue a little bit about we can all do the job. We can't, but we all have important jobs to do to make it work. You know, Christine, I think about just a, an analogy, uh, robotics for surgery. I still want that doctor in there guiding <laughs> what's happening, right? Uh, you know, we don't, we don't need any bad things happening. Well, same with software. You know, some of the worst folks at testing software developers, right? You're just too close to it, even if you're writing the automated tests. To your point, and I think several of you made this, is it's an opportunity for us to a collaborate much more and more closely together rather than testing to be the thing right before documentation at the very 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 end of the 
release, right? Which is what it used to be. But also, what do we automate? You know, it doesn't help to automate the wrong tests. Let's get the right things in there. And where's the user in the customer in performance, in functionality, in speed? By the way, one of the things that kind of baffled some development teams when I would say speed is quality. They're like, what do you mean speed's quality? It's like, well, if Netflix takes three seconds to start your video, okay, that's good. If it's pausing for three seconds every five minutes, that's bad, right? So it, speed makes a difference in terms of the perception of the experience. So it is a really kind of a harmonious effort where we have to bring all of that together. And and on, on that dimension, I'm going to play a little bit uh, devil's advocate uh, towards and against at the same time, uh, manual, where um, some forums that I participate here in Mexico uh, talk about that a lot, like, hey, uh, too much automation, are we manual testers going to be out of a job? And uh, the machines will replace us and all those uh, um, paranoid uh, ways of speaking. And I generally explain uh, to them with analogies. I like a lot to use analogies. In um, New York City, before there were any automobile, automobiles, cars, uh, there were lots of horses and horses produce a lot of stuff that was uh, dropped on the streets. And there was a job needed for that uh, to pick up some of the horse. Uh, and I'm sorry if this is an analogy of manual to what the horse produced, but um, the point that I'm trying to do is that once cars uh, become available, that job decreased considerably, but we still have places where there's people that work with the horses, maintain them, brush them, and do all that those tasks, which uh, as many cars we may have, we won't ever have um, a, a horse polishing machine or anything like that. There are things that truly a human mean is the only person that can do it really well. Manual testers are very good for those tasks. I think on the other hand, there are too many things that are tried to be done with uh, manual testing. I have seen in many organizations that um, there are tasks and tests that could be pushed left that could be started to be done before uh, automated programmatically and leave whatever is truly necessary and where the manual testers are going to be the rock stars and the only uh, ways to do it, allow them to. So I think, yes, I, I would suggest most manual testers uh, to start to pick up a little bit on technical and developing, yada, yada. I think uh, in the modern days and upcoming times, everyone should know some sort of development and should be on schools. And we're moving into a technological world at a pace that whoever doesn't pick it up uh, might be a bit um, handicapped. But uh, on the other hand, the skills of a good manual tester, when you have that clinical eye to say, hey, I see there, or you don't even have to touch the application and say, most probably it accepts uh, fields that it shouldn't in that field. And most of the times they are right. And you need that input. So on both sides, um, they won't be replaced, but they should get used to use the tools as they are. Technology are, is not here to replace them but to empower them and they should be able to use it. Uh, skills I think. can be, excuse me, skills can be enhanced. Absolutely. And I agree with what you say. Nobody wants another meeting on their schedule, but on my team, we have added what we call a test strategy meeting and we get the BA and the manual and the automation QAs in a room. And we talk about each of our um, stories and should we automate it? What are we looking for manually? And they've even, they took that further than when we first started. And they came up with a scoring guide to say, you know, what is our level of effort with this? Um, what's the repeatability for the user? Those types of things. And they've realized that those conversations are so important. And you're exactly right. Um, the manual testers aren't doing the same job. But now that we're able to really give them the time to pull those skills out, the, the critical thinking, um, and what you were mentioning, you know, looking at this field, we are getting so much more quality from our tests and from both sides. And it's really been a fantastic change. Yeah, that's, that's great. And optimizing and in a way, calling it where you get the best bang for your buck uh, 
where to use those efforts, how to use them, prioritizing, and even some things that, hey, this is not a big impact if we get a defect here, we won't even pay attention to it manually or automate it, or some others that this is critical if we get a problem, it has to be done manually with uh, two pair of human eyes, uh, capable eyes to identify it, or we can let the machine do it. I mean, there are um, balancing on testing, and I think falling into the cognition mental fallacy of, uh, it's called man with a hammer. Someone learns how to use a hammer well and we'll see needles everywhere and try to hammer them. There are, there, there are multiple other tools that we can use when it's needed, when it's more optimal. And I think uh, it, it's, it's, as you say, prioritize, distribute and make the best effort with each one of them. So so just getting into that, one of, one of the things in the matrix and one thing I always um, suggest is that exploratory testing. You take your manual testers and turn them into exploratory testers, finding those things that the functionality tests are not going to cover. I go, I, I always give an example that for those who don't know exploratory testing of you're on the web, you're ordering an item. You press the submit button and the screen comes up and says, do not hit the back button. Do not refresh this page. And the exploratory tester goes, yeah, back forward, back <laughs> forward, refresh, refresh. Maybe I'll get it for free. I don't know. There's <laughs> no way of telling. <laughs> and we live for those moments. We get it. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't you know, don't guys, make any buttons me, red. They'll be pressed. Right. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> but let me, let me. Let me kind of take our conversation a little bit of a way here. You know, we're, we're 25, 30 minutes in. We haven't spoken a lot about DevOps, which is interesting, right? Especially in light of our original conversation off camera. You know, when we talk about behavioral di driven testing and, and, and ADD, you know, testing and performance testing, these, these testing disciplines all existed before DevOps, right? Ken, you're doing them for a fifth of a century or more, right? And, and <laughs> you know, that certainly predates what we call DevOps. And, and I was here when I started DevOps.com back in 2013, 14. There were a lot of testers who were running around like, you know, Henny Penny, the sky is falling, that they were going to be out of a job, they were going to be obsolete overnight. And of course, that hasn't happened. Christine, you said that DevOps was kind of a driving factor in why you, you took the baton here, why you took this position, why you feel it's important. Um, I'd like to bring you back our conversation a little bit to DevOps. How has DevOps changed BDD, ADD, right? Automation, absolutely, right? But automation is not necessarily DevOps. Right. We, we automate it. We've mentioned a little shift left, you know, pushing it further, not pushing it further on the developer's shoulders, because as Ken, you said, we don't need, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Right. We don't need that. But how can we how can we be more efficient, better at testing? Is it just a matter of automation or is there something else there? Christine, I'm going to ask you first, because it, it's something that I think is near and dear to your mission. Sure. And I think for me, really, it is the conversations. It, it, how long have has QA sat outside of the development organization, right? I mean, we're, we can bring them in if we talk about Agile and Scrum and things like that, even again before DevOps, we can have a tester embedded in that team, but we still have lots of organizations that don't do that. Um, realizing that quality, not testing, that quality is the responsibility of the entire team and that we everybody needs to contribute to that conversation. Um, we talk about you know breaking down the silos and everything with DevOps and we're all in this together and that includes testing. And for me, that's been the biggest part. We can talk about BDD or whatever we wanna talk about, however we want to test something. The most important part to me is that the testers are at the table and that they're part of that conversation. And, and I think that's inherently part of the DevOps cultural kind of mantra is that everyone should have a seat at the table. Ken? So, 
So, so one of the things, getting back to the DevOps, um, is the fact that every time you have a test failure after something has been actually de developed and put into the pipeline means you've got a loop back, means that you are slowing down the flow of business value through that pipeline. So the reason we want to create all these tests first is so that we pass them and when it goes into deployment or staging, wherever you put it, that you don't get a test failure. You don't have to triage everything. And so that's why creating all of the tests first that the developers can be running while they're developing their code or in their development environment is so important. Now, I'd just like to add one more little phrase that I, I always use uh, or talk about is every requirement should have a test for it, right? Pretty straightforward. Or how do you know whether the requirement is actually being met? But every test is a requirement. If you cannot ship a system with a failing test, then that test is a requirement the system must meet. One of the things that developers always complain about is not having enough requirements, unclear requirements. The test that you create prior to implementation, BDD, ATDD, or however you get them, are the requirements. And now the developers have the test that they can go against those requirements, make it pass, and then the flow through the pipeline doesn't stop. It doesn't, you, you don't have a blockage because of failure later on. Fair. And then, and then on that? Yep. Uh, catching, catching those uh, errors, defining them, and being a bit more um, synergistic, to call it in a way, it's uh, crucial. Uh, you very well mentioned all the testing practices, areas, and um, disciplines that exist come from Waterfall and even before. But I think a shift uh, that was forced by DevOps, any uh, agile methodology, continuous releases, forced us to think it um, in, in a different way. And I don't know if it was the chicken or the egg where we started to uh, start to see that we needed to throw down these uh, silos and as well that the communication channels and uh, capabilities to observe what was happening. Because as a tester, um, 15 years ago, I remember you would just receive something finished. You had no idea. And somehow you had some peculiarly written requirements that you had to write tests for and to try to figure out, but everything was already packed up, uh, backed up, ready to ship. And you were just trying to uh, stop like a meteorite that was about to hit. And you were like, I don't even have control. I detect something, I send it um, before a, a production release. And I have these bugs that I detected. I'm sending them somewhere probably the developers were even gone. All those situations that we experienced before on any testing area, that now that everything is happening continuously fast, we have feedback, we have, uh, we don't own only the development side, the testing side, the operation side, but we own all the loop we're involved and hopefully we have communication with each one of those uh, areas and I would say not communication, that the lines that divided us uh, are blurry now. We are just multi-cap, T-shaped people that can jump into, hey, now uh, this is a deal with development on ops. I understand that this is happening. We have logs. We have different release methodologies. I think DevOps and the openness that is happening as well as from my perspective, performance, that I have some tools now that allow me to see into the code, to monitor it, telemetry, all these fun things that we can work with have allowed us to evolve and to integrate, as it, it was very well said, from clear requirements, clearly knowing what is needed. If we detect something wherever, not only before releasing to production, but now it's in ops, there's a bug that was not caught and we catch it right away. We roll back or we release quickly a fix. Those uh, things were forced given those things, or I don't know if forced again, I don't know if it's uh, 
chicken and an egg uh, situation. What came first? If now we have more the visibility and capabilities, we start to release more often and communicate development and operations. But all this synergy has to happen and is needed for us to truly uh, embrace DevOps, have quality in it, and keep releasing often with quality. You know, Alan, I have a question I'd like to pose to the team uh, about DevOps. You know, we don't do DevOps just for DevOps sake, right? There's usually mm -hmm. some drivers behind it. And you think about the conditions we're in today, economic conditions, um, changing markets, rebuilding, um, you know, supply chains, contactless services. There's a great example. In days, in a few weeks, businesses had to respond. Point being, one of the things businesses are looking for from their technology, from their software, is agility. The ability to respond quickly, experiment, go after opportunity, but defensive, whatever it might be. From a, a testing um, standpoint, how, how do you think that's changed how you respond and how do you do the work uh, that you do? Knowing that there are, there are situations you have to react, react fast, um, and how has that changed how you work? Any, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, sorry, go on. I have played too much today. <laughs> well, let me just give an example of a, a current situation. There is one place that I was consulting with. Their manual testing effort took 5,000 hours to release a product. You're not going to be very agile if it takes you 5,000 hours. That's 50 testers working over a month. And I don't know even know what they did if they found a defect, whether they restarted again. So the whole concept of being agile is you need, as we talked about, all the automation around everything. Because if I'm going to make a little change to something, I want to make sure I haven't broken anything else. So I need the automation that matches exactly what the requirements are so that then I can run it through my the pipeline. If I don't have the automation, I have to pause for three days for manual testing, um, I'm not gonna get things out pretty quickly. And to build on to that point with BDD, you can see so clearly where you have a failure in your test. When I joined my current organization, they had just really started with automation and there wasn't a lot of direction there, which is fine. That is not any kind of a you know, criticism, but those tests got so complicated and only the people who were writing the tests knew what was happening in them and where those failures were. And troubleshooting a failure could take just as long as troubleshooting the code. I mean, there was, so taking something like BDD, we're gonna build on the agility. We wanna make it open to the team. The manual tester can find out where that failure was. A developer can find out where that failure was. And then we can very easily test to see test the test to find out if it was a problem with the test or if it's a problem in the code and then send it to the appropriate place to get it addressed. I think that that piece has just been a huge, um, a huge improvement for what's been happening. And uh, I, I want to add as well from what you mentioned, what's changed um, from the old waterfall days to how we are working now with the new trends and everything. I, I think the first problem uh, that I personally experienced, and I fought against this agile uh, B stuff that started to happen. Uh, why don't you allow me to still do automated big ass low tests every uh, before a release? How am I going to be able to keep up with this uh, if I have constant releases every two weeks? And here, I think the biggest thing is a change of mindset because um, many of us, and again, I say, I say this myself, I was indoctrinated into how the waterfall days and silo um, phased uh, release cycles happened. And I, I didn't, I cannot even call it cycles. It was just like a, the big bang release and that was it and you're out. And you used to think that way. You had to do big um, Re, uh, cycles of automations that you could execute that took uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours, people involved. And now you need to think about how can I tackle this now that is supposed to happen so often, uh, but it, a big change is that it's not so massive anymore. We are not doing a whole full release that we need to do multiple regressions here and there and everywhere to make sure. Now we can just like say, hey, this sprint, I'm just going to release this tiny little 
little feature that we can just quickly test. Something breaks, something happens. We are sure that our team, ourselves included, can switch direction, um, detect where is the issue, um, and implement a fix. And probably tomorrow, if we are super efficient, super quick, and doing things differently, we can uh, recover from it. As uh, you mentioned earlier, when there's a, a, a tons of tests that you need to execute and there's an error that uh, you detect, it's there. There's a bug, uh, but we want to release every week, every two sprints. Sometimes even modern mindset uh, could be, well, let it go to production. It's going to pester us for a day or two, but we know that we can quickly apply a fix, release it. Let it, let it pass. It will cause a tiny bit of problems and even... Uh, change the course, change the direction if you need it. Like, hey, that's a feature we don't need. We can take it off. So all that um, mindset changing on how you approach uh, testing with this has to change. It's very different. Uh, and and I work with lots of customers where I, I jump in and like, yeah, why are you still doing these things that are a decade, two decades old, where... All this um, DevOps, continuous, Agile is already happening and you're even trying to do Agile, but you have this big bang release, huge uh, pieces of functionality that you want to push. That's not going to help you. And you need to be paying attention constantly and enable that you can recover. Your testing needs to be aimed at enabling that tiny functionality tests everywhere and just relevant to what you're doing. It's a complete switch of mind of what was testing before and what is today. Fascinating. I, just that idea of being able to release software quickly, right? Instead of six months or 12 months, it's that's mind boggling shift right there. Sorry, Alan, you were, you were taking. No, no, I'm, I'm actually saying, well, I think we're about out of time. I was going to ask us to, you know, wrap up. I was going to wrap up, but you know what, Mitchell, I gave you the last word. That's great. Um, hey guys, as I said earlier on, the time does go really quick. We're, we're out of time for this episode. I'd love to have you all back, though. Maybe we can continue this conversation. You know, I find it fascinating as someone who doesn't come from the testing world, right, that testing in its infinite variety has been so profoundly impacted by DevOps and Agile and these technologies. But rather than being left behind, it's been accelerated, Right, we through automation and and speed and 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 quite frankly more focus. In many ways, DevOps has been one of the best things that's ever happened to testing, right? And that's the thought I want to leave you with out there for DevOps Unbound. This is Alan Schimmel. We'll see you on our next show. We have a great roundtable coming up, by the way. Check check DevOpsUnbound.com for all the latest. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to our panel. Mitchell, as always, thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias.